So ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. It's a great pleasure to have you today uh, for this webinar brought to you by the DKSH Patient and Payer Solutions Team. My name is Nicholas and I shall be the moderator for today. Today's discussion will center around a very important topic. Why ethics and compliance are key to patient support programs. This webinar will be split into three broad segments. First segment will touch on the importance of ethics and compliance in patient support programs, followed by a segment on, which is my personal favorite, how to push boundaries of innovation yet ensure compliance in PSPs. And lastly, ethics versus compliance. To shed light on these topics, I have with me three expert panelists. We have Tal Frelik, who is my colleague and the Regional Senior Manager for Healthcare Compliance at DKSH. He has more than nine years experience as a compliance professional and specializes in tailoring compliance programs to risk and business needs. Joining us from Merck, we have Sergio Abreu, who is the Regional Compliance Officer of APAC. Sergio started his career as an independent lawyer and has been with Merck in a legal and compliance capacity since 2007. Currently, he is the APAC Head of Compliance across all business sectors at Merck. Lastly, we have John Chung, who is partner at Freshfields. John heads the China Compliance and Arbitration Practice with a focus on North Asia disputes. Over the last 20 years, John has acted as a trusted advisor to many life science companies in Asia, and he works with clients to improve their internal compliance processes. Ladies and gentlemen, during the course of the webinar, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A chat box. We shall allocate the last 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webinar to answer them. Now, before we jump into the first segment, it would be interesting to get your views on why do you think ethics and compliance are important for PSPs? We have prepared a poll for this. To enter your views, kindly switch on your mobile phone camera, scan the barcode, which will take you to the landing page of the poll. There are no right or wrong answers, just what you think is the most relevant to you. So let's see if your view will match up with the ones uh, from the panelists. So we have the first option. The PSPs is important because it can influence treatment choice by doctors. Uh, the second one, it affects patient privacy. Third option, which is um, it can prevent fraud. And lastly, uh, companies reput reputation damage. Uh, so we'll allow 20 seconds for audience, you know, to key in their selection. Right. So we've got already we see 17 percent, which think that uh, because of treatment choice uh, by by doctors. At 50%, which is majority, uh, thinks it's important because of patient privacy, and 33% uh, because of company's reputation. Interesting. So again, without further ado, we go to the first question, which is similar to the question for the poll. And this question is posed to Sergio. So Sergio, why is ethical behavior so important in PSPs? Maybe you can shed light on this. Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks uh, for the invite to be part of this uh, session. Very interesting topic. Good afternoon to all of the, the audience. And yeah, as, um, as you just said, I think it's very important to make sure that uh, ethical uh, norms and values are really at the top of the list when, when referring to these kind of programs. And because of the fact of not having really specific compliance guidelines on, on PSPs in Asia. Uh, 
in absence of, of, of these specific regulations, it's, it's the duty of companies to ensure that uh, these kind of programs are done uh, and are carefully analyzed, right, from a compliance principle standpoint, but also having all of the other relevant functions involved in the discussion. I think from the experience, it's important to have different perspectives, different angles being uh, analyzed in the risks, right, market access, medical, legal, uh, data privacy, and we just saw with the answers provided by the audience on, on how this becomes very key, right? Regulatory and all other functions giving, right, uh, light around what are we trying to do, how we're going to interact, right? How a certain program uh, wants to be structured. So I think that uh, focusing on, on, on the why and the how becomes key, right? Uh, therefore, looking into the context, uh, what is the, the the business purpose? What are we trying to do here as a company? Uh, and and overall, as as we just mentioned, how how the the the, the program wants to be uh, finally deployed or implemented, right? Who will be the different players, of course, and and the interaction among among each of them. PSPs can have various forms and structures. So, um, and under the umbrella of a PSP, we can or we usually involve different. Um, uh, kinds of interactions that we need to really understand before we jump into uh, implementing them. So in addition also to, to treatment matters, uh, we need to, to consider the compliance rule, right? The compliance golden rule, which could be summarized in something like avoiding the, the, the potential undue, right? Uh, inducement in the form of financing or rendering support uh, to patients or other uh, similar activity uh, or equivalents. This is a place of risk which requires to us to really raise the ethical bar, right? Um, and uh, lastly, I think interactions with patients is becoming a critical area. Uh, we just said that there is uh, not a lot of regulations uh, around this area, but the voice of the patients continues to gain terrain, right? And we often now hear how most of the companies are focusing on the patient, patient-centric, uh, uh, having the patient at the center, etc. So I think we should expect, and we are seeing this trend starting, uh, to see more further uh, or further regulations on the matter, right? So this is, of course, uh, with intent of protecting patients' independence and ensuring that companies have the proper interactions with them. Privacy, as we mentioned, uh, it's a very important aspect to consider, right? Um, in this it's a lot of sensitive information that generally is managed or discussed within these kind of programs, right? Which under the light of, of uh, data privacy, it's very, uh, it's, it's sensitive data that needs to be protected and used correctly, right? To avoid unwanted consequences to, to, to pharma companies. And uh, also uh, it's important to mention that there is a clear search uh, in government enforcement with several famous cases. Right, that were investigated and sanctioned. Right, we can we can refer to uh, to uh, Ager, Agerion in 2017 or United Therapeutics in 2018, um, which were accused of paying kickbacks to 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 patients through independent charitable foundations. This is within a, a copayment structured in in the U.S. So, this is being uh, really followed up by uh, by authorities and prosecutors. So, as companies, we need to be very careful when we uh, deploy these uh, pr uh, programs, uh, such as patient support programs. And thank you very much, Sergio, for for sharing your views. And you know, you talked about you know, I think summed up really well. Uh, in terms of the importance and, and why, um, then should there be, you know, a, a different ethical standard uh, for PSPs in this case, uh, you know, uh, which is separate from the general business? Uh, what do you think on that? I think that uh, uh, compliance principles and, and, and ethical standards, you know, they, they, they are really the general ones applies to 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 all of the activities we do, right? The ethical bar that uh, measures a little bit what we do as a company, at the at the really high level, it's it's the same. Then we have the specifics, right? That we mentioned uh, on on the interactions with patients, right? Like we we said, data privacy, data privacy, and 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 how we are really um, discussing with the patients and how are this is engagements and interactions are happening within the companies. Um, and uh, the patients itself, usually through 
uh, HCPs, but again, the voice of the, the patient is, is much heard there. We have a lot of interactions that are uh, ramping up with patients' organizations, right, uh, that also become uh, a key player in this kind of, of, uh, of activities that we can implement in practice. So therefore, I think I would say that the, the general principles would be the same, but as we go through the details, right, and understanding on how we can really um, uh, implement those interactions is when certain specific aspects that we generally mentioned also come into play. Sure, thanks, thanks, Sergio, uh, for sharing. Um, and you know, following, you know, what you have mentioned, Sergio, I think you know the audience would also be interested. And my second question is to Tal now, uh, with regards to consequences. Uh, if there is a breach or compromises in ethics and compliance for PSPs, uh, you know, what would be the ramifications? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. And, um, and again, uh, thank you everyone uh, for attending this very important topic and this uh, very important session. Uh, Sergio mentioned a lot of uh, valuable points, which um, I think can really um, show the, the different consequences that might take place um, when we compromise uh, on ethics and compliance uh, in PSPs. As Sergio mentioned, um, there isn't a lot of compliance guidelines. Okay, There aren't a lot of compliance guidelines when it comes to how to behave uh, in PSPs. It's a relatively new um, in this part of the world, at least where we, we conduct our operations. And um, it is important for us to raise the ethical bar. OK, it is important to raise the ethical bar when it comes to PSPs. Um, before I go to the consequences, I just want to add something to um, maybe the, the answer given by Sergio in your previous question about uh, should we have separate ethical standards? Um, I do believe that um, part of our job as compliance professionals is to be able to tailor um, policies or guidelines or, or standard operating procedures to the needs of the business. And um, this is a very important part, which I think tailoring uh, compliance guidelines when it comes to PSP um, can really help because we as compliance professionals, we can outline, we can flag touch points and we can flag um, incidents and we can flag uh, things that happen in the procedure of PSPs, which maybe the business operations really haven't thought about. So um, I do believe that yes, I mean, it is something that we should go to. Um, about your question, what are some consequences? So these consequences, I think we can start with companies' risks, okay? When these things go live or go public, when there is, a, when there is an investigation, of any regulatory authority, whether it's the US Department of Justice or anyone else, we see that there is a damage to the company's reputation. Okay, because the next to the company's name, you can always see um, data, articles, things that happened in the past, the amount of fine that was paid. And this is a damage to the company's reputation, which of course can affect uh, operations, future margins and acquisitions, uh, applying to government tenders and etc. Um, loss of business, of course, is most likely the 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 most common consequence when when your reputation is being damaged. And but I think we should, if we look at the holistic view of PSPs, when we compromise in ethics and compliance, we compromise the integrity of the procedure, the integrity of the process. Because at the end of the day, what are we doing here? We are trying to assist patients that are not able to get the right treatment for them. And when we compromise ethics and compliance, when we try to gain an unfair business advantage, when we are trying to promote our interest, which might conflict with the interest of the best treatment to the patient, we are compromising or damaging the integrity of the procedure. And this is maybe even more severe when you do PSPs because your, your interaction with the patient here is very high because we're actually touching, touching their lives, touching their treatment. Um, which leads me to the patient's risk. 
they might get the less suitable treatment. Okay, and at the end of the day, our job is to to enrich their lives. Our job is to make sure they get the right treatment. Our job is to make sure that they get the treatment that they need based on their disease, of course, their situation. So they're getting the less suitable treatment. Um, but we should also bear in mind that the compromise here or the consequence here can be in both ways, not only on the company, not only on the patient or three ways, but also on the physician. OK, uh, because when the integrity of the treatment is harmed or damaged, it is a risk that the physician will need to take. And, uh, and most likely they will not want to take that because the consequences are severe. So um, to summarize my answer, I think that first we need to look at the reason why we are doing PSPs. What's the reason? Why? What's the reason why companies are investing so many resources and efforts in, in engaging in patient support programs? Um, we need to look at the company's risk, which is reputation, loss of business, integrity of the process is compromised. We need to look at the patient risk, which are not getting the right suitable treatment for them. And also there might be some legal implications on the physician, uh, because if they do this, there will be legal implications on them also. Right, thank, you, thank you very much, Tal. Certainly insightful um, you know, on the consequences uh, in case there are compromises. And you know, I, want, I want to pose an additional question here you know, to John. Uh, so with regards to, you know, PSPs, you know, based on, you know, what Tal has shared, um, which areas, you know, in PSPs are most at risk for abuse? Uh, what's your opinion on that, uh, John? And, you know, based on your experience, uh, how do you see it? Sure. And very good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you again for the invitation to join um, this session today. Um, perhaps I'll just pick up um, quickly on one point that um, was mentioned um, by Tao just before um, I address your question, Nick. And that was in relation to the consequences of non-compliance um, in the PSP space. And I agree entirely with um, what was said in relation to the impact on the company, on patients and on physicians or HCPs. And I'll give it a bit of a practical perspective also, because this is something that we have seen in a number of our cases involving investigations. And practically the additional impact, um, which cannot be underestimated on a company and the business is this. Now, if a company is levied with a large fine, or worse still, there's um, potential criminal liability. What we then sometimes find with companies which are hit with these fines is a culture of over compliance. Now, don't get me wrong, compliance is important and you certainly want to ensure that compliance standards, ethical standards are raised after you have an incident um, that has been uncovered and, and the company has been fined. But what we do quite often find is that after there's been a large fine levied, you have this culture of over compliance where companies become overly cautious about doing anything. Um, now, you do want adequate compliance, but you also need to recognize that ultimately it is a business. And what you have with over compliance is too much caution on the part of the business to do anything new. And that can then have a significant knock on impact for a number of years because a company is put at a competitive disadvantage and unlike its peer manufacturers, for example, it decides not to engage in um, other practices that the rest of the industry find is perfectly fine and which is perfectly compliant because, as I said, because of this fear of um, crossing the um, line in the sand. And in the particular context of PSPs, for example, what you then might see is a reluctance to engage in PSP programs. PSPs, as we know, in, in principle are beneficial programs that are legitimate if properly run. But then you then have this situation where companies are reluctant to engage in PSPs. And of course, you lose many of the benefits that flow from being involved in a PSP. So just to kind of highlight this kind of practical point, which is an additional risk factor, not often, I think, fully recognized um, by companies before or after um, there's been a large fine levied, but I think a real risk and, and serious concern to the business with serious consequences um, over the course of a number of years. Now, um, having addressed that point, I'll move on to your question, Nick, around areas where PSPs are most at risk. And what we do find in Asia is that PSP programs vary quite a bit 
um, indeed, if we look at what has um, happened in the US, which is mentioned earlier on, some of those problems were a bit more specific to the way uh, Medicare and other programs were run in the US in their context. And what we find of Asia and different jurisdictions, actually the way PSP programs are set up can be quite different. The extent of government involvement, the involvement insurance companies, for example, or the extent of um, subsidies that are given. And so the consequence of that is that you do actually need to have quite a tailored PSP program to deal with different issues, higher risk issues in different jurisdictions. And that's, of course, one of the difficulties with designing or crafting a PSP a compliance program. But with that um, caveat, I think the higher risk areas that we generally see are obviously around how patients are selected, for example. Um, I think other concerns around what is being communicated to these patients by whom um, and of course whether there's some interference in the communications that's taking place. Um, similarly, as we find in many other compliance um, programs, intermediary risk is clearly of concern in the PSP space as it is in other areas. But as I said, I think one of the greater risk factors, one of the things why PSPs are I would put um, in a higher risk category and, and it's attracting more attention is because first, as has been mentioned, there's very little guidance out there in Asia in terms of what compliance standards should be applied, but also the fact that PSP programs are quite innovative. They are kind of pushing the boundaries, the envelope of what is acceptable or not. And that by its very nature means that it's really quite important to tailor the compliance program to deal with the specific situation. Uh, I think that's a point that was also touched on the Sergio um, earlier on, which I entirely agree with. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, John, for your sharing. Certainly insightful. Um, so I think that concludes the end of the first segment. We shall move on uh, to the second segment on how to push boundaries of innovation yet ensure compliance uh, in PSPs. I think before we start, you know, let's um, see what the audience thinks. Um, so we have another poll and, you know, just Flip up your phone, uh, scan the barcode again, and you know you can choose the multiple options. Um, so first, you've got the lack of process and policies, uh, which is a challenge, you know, in your organization. Or you could choose, you know, lack of compliance uh, culture uh, in terms of you know executing your your policies and processes. Or it could be uh, lack of you know, people with compliance expertise. So we'll allocate, you know, 20 seconds for the input from the audience. Right. I see. Right, interesting. So we have currently half of the audience um, stated lack of processes and policies. 20% uh, uh, in terms of culture, which is the biggest challenge. And lastly, uh, lack of people with compliance expertise at 30%. Interesting. Right, so we'll move on to, to the next segment uh, with regards to innovation and compliance. Um, so the first question here I'm going to pose to you, John, is, you know, could you share with the audience what are the, some of the practical ways in which, you know, life sciences companies can innovate while remaining in compliance with laws, regulations and standards? Sure, thanks very much again, Nick. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I think there's an acceptance. PSPs are inherently a good initiative, but unfortunately one that is open to abuse. And it is also an area where one can be a bit more innovative with the kinds of programs. And I, I think as your question rightly raises, it, it's a matter of weighing that balance of ensuring that you can have an innovative and effective program, but still one that is compliant because the more innovative things are in general, uh, the, the risks of compliance and failures are, are somewhat heightened. 
So in the case of PSPs, when we talk about how you deal with this balance, I think one of the particular challenges, as I alluded to earlier, are PSP practices are inherently varied across the region. So that increases the difficulty of coming up with a program and also the absence of rules um, it is in a way a, a double um, concern which raises further challenges to creating effective PSP program. And I think it was interesting that the survey results, I think, seem to support this view that one of the reasons why you don't have such an effective, strong PSP compliance program in place is just the rules are not really there. And I, I would imply, infer from that, that it's challenging to create those rules. And that's, of course, precisely where um, professionals like yourself would come into play in helping to create um, the rules. Now, what are the practical steps that can be taken to help to create these rules and to ensure that we balance between innovation and compliance? Now, I think at the outset, of course, one has to be very, very clear on the objective of a PSP. What is it for? And it has to be focused on patient benefit. That is the driving force behind the PSP. It's obviously not to increase marketing or branding or, or other considerations like like that, but it's fundamentally about patient benefit. So there has to be clear internal alignment within um, an organization on that objective. Then once you have that established, one has to be clear about the risks that are arising from a particular setup and an organization, the way it's run. So map out these risks in the context of PSPs. So um, as I mentioned earlier, for example, interference between the communications um, between the HCP and the patient, that may well be one risk factor in the PSP context. But these risk factors will vary between jurisdictions. So it's important to create a tailored program and to identify the higher risk areas, the high risk challenges in each of these jurisdictions, given the way the PSP programs might be run and to then focus on those risk areas. Um, I mentioned some of the risk areas um, earlier, um, Nick, but other risk areas, I think, um, are probably themes around independence, for example, independence of decision making, independence of identification of patients. Conflict of interest has been mentioned, but clearly a risk area. Um, risk of inducements is a classic compliance concern, but also a real concern in the context of PSPs, as we've seen in some of the previous cases that was mentioned. Um, and of course, data privacy, again, a really important area highlighted by the survey um, in relation to topic one and a the general theme of equal access. So once we identify all these kind of risk, typical risk concerns and areas, then it's a matter of working through the scenario and developing a system, a set of rules, a set of procedures um, to address each of these risk areas in the context in which the PSP program is run. Again, one of the challenges we often find when we investigate after something has gone wrong is a bit of passing of the buck. So in other words, no one having clear responsibility for each of these risk areas or for certain aspects of the program. So having clear responsibility is absolutely important especially in a program where you're at the cutting edge and constantly pushing the limits because that's when sometimes the areas and lines of responsibility um, get somewhat um, um, jumbled up. Now buy-in from the employees as part of the program is absolutely crucial as we can imagine, um, no less crucial in Asia and arguably even more so in Asia where the compliance culture, the history of a compliance culture is perhaps shorter than in somewhat developed markets. There might be perhaps less buy-in from employees and as we know the Asia business market um, just moves along so much more rapidly. So buy-in is really important that employees are driven um, by proper um, inducements as it were to perform and to ensure that they are compliant um, as is the PSP program they're involved in. Then you come to actual implementation of this program that's been established. Um, I'm a big fan of audits and checks, random audits, of course, not, not audits which just go through a checklist which are pretty pointless, but audits that put stress on the system that's in place, audits that try to find weaknesses in what has been developed, audits which are somewhat random in nature and, and essentially really as part of an auditing exercise, stepping back and taking stock um, and looking at where the program is being strong and where the areas of weakness have been identified and then of course consequently updating and improving the program and flowing on from that.
Um, so really the aim is to recognize, and this is important for innovative programs like PSPs in particular, the aim is to recognize that it's not just a checklist of compliance rules which are fairly static in nature, but rather rules and procedures that evolve um, to deal with challenges and, and indeed the ways in which PSP programs um, develop and, and possibly push the boundaries a little bit more. And last point, again, an important one, one that's been mentioned before, I'm sure, but one which in my experience is crucial. And that is at the end of the day, though, this program has to be workable and practical. So it has to be acceptable to the business because that's how one gets buy-in from the business. If there isn't buy-in, you could have the best compliance program in the world in theory, but then people will find ways of getting around it. So a program that's been developed with business that is workable, but of course one which doesn't compromise on the ethical and compliance standards we've um, talked about earlier. Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, John, for sharing. I like how you mentioned, you know, the objective of the PSPs are, uh, you know, very, very important. You know, from the outset, you need to determine, you know, what the objective is and what is the benefit for the patient. And I like, you know, how you mentioned the implementation of audits. You know, with the um, you know technology today, uh, you know auditing has been made easier. You know, with platforms, e audits. Uh, do you see, you know, in terms of frequency of audits, would that play a big role in ensuring you know compliance and ethics? Uh, yeah, I think that's a really great question. So it goes back to a team I mentioned earlier, which is the idea of a bit of randomness around the audits. So if you have them too frequently or you have them at you know, for example, quarterly intervals or certain fixed intervals, then there is a risk that the system becomes static. So it doesn't really catch new issues. It doesn't really push the envelopes or the limits. And what you mentioned about technology is really interesting because what, we, what we've seen is about five, 10 years ago, you started seeing a real push towards technology as a means of conducting effective audits. Um, in the compliance space. And I think it's fair to say that when these systems, these state of the art systems were pushed out initially, they really did seem on paper to be effective and to catch various failings in the system. But then after a while, what we've seen is a bit of stagnation where these systems have kind of reached the natural limit of what they can do. And yeah. unless the systems evolve rapidly enough or you have a new, you know, incredible new AI technology that hasn't really been tried before that pushes the limits. You find that it's it's kind of neat reaching a kind of natural plateau or limit in terms of what it can catch. So again, I think it goes back to a theme I mentioned of a constantly evolving audit testing process um, that, that as it were kind of keeps everyone on their toes. Obviously I recognize that in practice it's expensive and we all work with limited resources and I think one of the survey results was a lack of compliance professionals, and that is really a struggle in the industry. So what I've just described is, of course, theoretical and practice, there are real challenges. But I think at least conceptually, that is how I see an ideal compliance program being run and tested. Right, thanks. Thanks, John, for, for your insights on that. Um, so I think following, you know, uh, John, from what you said, you know, with regards to, you know, the buy-in of stakeholders, right? Um, so next question is uh, for Tal. Uh, so how do we then, you know, convince the internal stakeholders with regards to the importance of compliance? Thanks, Nick. Um, excellent question. Um, and I think that from my experience working as a, as a compliance professional, I think the first thing that is very important is um, people skills. OK, soft skills. Um, just coming to um, the stakeholders and telling them, listen, you have to do this because this is what the company decide, decided this will never work. OK, we have to convince them. We have to to ensure they understand the rationale. Um, you know, um, I had a manager in the past that once told me that um, the seven most expensive words in business are we have always done it that way. OK. These are the seven most expensive words in business because people are afraid of changes. People are afraid of, you know, of doing these kind of things and implementing more. Uh, John mentioned monitoring and putting some stress on the system and making people doing some more actions in order to improve things. But we have to convince the stakeholders that there is a rationale behind the things that we are asking. Because at the end of the day, the purpose here is to promote 
high ethical standards. Um, uh, I mean, each and every company has a purpose, has its own value, code of conduct, values like um, enriching people's lives and integrity. They're not just written there just for fun or just because everyone else are doing it. We are putting it because we believe in it, okay? Because at the end of the day, our purpose is to enrich these people's lives. So we need to touch the stakeholders and to explain to them that there are more aspects of the operations which they must think of. Um, having an effective compliance program helps the purpose, okay? It helps the purpose of enriching people's life. It helps the purpose of making sure that our ethical norms and the ethical bar is, is even higher, specifically in things like PXPs. And, and I think to summarize it, which, which, you know, can always help. I mean, sometimes helps. If people think compliance is expensive, try non-compliant, okay? And, and it's also important to, to make sure that people understand the risk, okay, of what's going on if we be non-compliant. And you can show fines and, and, and FCP resolutions and settlements and deferred prosecution agreements and costs of external monitors and costs of uh, getting fresh fields to come to your company and review and audit everything that you're doing. All of these costs, I think that the, the stakeholders need to take in consideration. So sometimes it's maybe preferable for them to listen to you as a compliance professional um, and not go to these um, very severe cases. So, um, but I think again, I will, I will end with what I've started. The key is people skills, okay? To learn how to talk to these stakeholders, to learn how to gain their trust, okay? And this will always help you if it's PSPs or promoting your ethical program, it will help you with understanding what's the rationale behind the actions that you're asking or behind the procedures you're trying to implement. Uh, thank you very much, Tala. Certainly something, you know, we can uh, all take home, you know, in terms of, you know, how do we convince, you know, our stakeholders. Um, so I think that um, ends, you know, our second segment uh, for today. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, third segment of uh, this webinar which is uh, ethics versus compliance. You know, what, what is the difference? And, you know, the first question I want to pose to Sergio. You know, earlier on, you know, I think almost all of you guys have been talking about the lack of compliance guidelines, uh, you know, within Asia, right? Uh, so when there are no official compliance guidelines, how do we design our programs ethically? Um, yeah, I think this is, um very much connected to what was uh, mentioned before right uh, uh, by by John and Tal uh, the absence of regulations should not be an excuse for not doing the right thing right even when when no one is looking right we need to make sure that we understand what is our objective we understand that we what we are trying to do is at the end of the day benefiting our uh, our patients making their lives better right so this is our ultimate goal, right? And therefore, not having guidance there, it's, it would not be something that, okay, let's do whatever we want. There are a lot of risks that have been clearly mentioned that are underlying when we have this kind of programs and are interacting with, with patients, right? So how to design uh, a program ethically already set, right? Making sure that we have the buy-in of our stakeholders, right? Uh, we we start making a change on how our people think, right? What what Dal mentioned around the, the skills, right? Making sure that uh, we we work on the power of habit, right? This this means basically focusing on mindset, right? Uh, on on basic ethical principles for for our for teams to think on the why before going into the how, right? Why is that our company wants to do this? What are we trying to pursue? Right? What is that we are really? What's that benefit? And again, I highlight that concept, which is uh, the, the 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 goal of our PSPs. This is easy to say, right? But it's it's some it's it's very challenging to navigate it in practice, right? It requires a change in the culture and how people understand compliance overall. Uh, it is common to see that people, when are you confronted to regulations or to a compliance officer, 
uh, or somebody providing right the the framework on how to conduct an activity, they say just tell me yes or no, right? And 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 we're not taking the time usually to go to uh, you know to the genesis of all, right? So this is changing on the way on how we analyze or we approach certain discussions, and secondly, understanding the concept the concept behind that. What are those general principles that we referred at the beginning, guiding our activities and our interactions when we when we uh, um, run programs like this? So here, the the famous red face test. How would you feel if your actions would have been uh, disclosed into the news? If your actions were to be in the headline of 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 tomorrow's newspaper, right? So putting ourselves also in and 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 when I mean ourselves is the whole people involved in in these activities into the shoes of an external auditor right into somebody that's uh, completely stranger to the to the to the program which do, does not have the full knowledge right a prosecutor or what a judge would say if they need to analyze what we're doing and this goes to what John mentioned right Seeing what you're doing is really when you audit and you monitor this, it's really in practice tackling those risks that we have mentioned uh, before. So how solid is your case, right? So this basically means how, how robust uh, are your explanations if you are to defend your actions, OK? But as we said, navigating compliance waters can be tricky and, 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 and certainly unpredictable. OK, so we need to be cautious and, and take those calculated risks. And this is also connected to what John mentioned before, being, you know, over compliant, right? So we need to make sure that we are. Going through our actions with a thorough discussion, with a thorough analysis and understanding different angles, as we said also at the beginning. So it's key not to lose the high level perspective, right? During the whole process uh, uh, analysis of a program like this, taking into consideration all of those risks that were mentioned, that as you have heard, there are very, very, let's say, various risks from different angles that need to be taken into account. And sometimes, and or most of the times, unfortunately, not very clear due to the fact of, 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 ha of not having specific guidance, specific common understandings, different jurisdictions, re different regulations, different focus of risks in different countries, around the APEC region gives us a, that extra challenge to make sure that we are really focusing on the right areas and at the end of the day having this program which can explain by itself right from a goal perspective but also from a practical perspective on why we're doing and how are we doing the different actions that we are um, deploying in a, in, in a program like this. Thank you very much Sergio. I think really insightful uh, sharing, uh, which leads me, you know, to the next question I have uh, for Tal and John. You know, maybe Tal, you can expand on this further. Uh, how then, you know, should PSPs be designed according to our ethical values? So um, I think the first thing or the most important thing, and you know, talking about uh, having an effective seven elements of an effective compliance program or, or talking on effectiveness of a compliance program is first of all when you start to design this you must get the endorsement of your top management okay tone of the top because um, this needs to come from from way up okay and to be cascaded down uh, to the teams the regional teams the local teams the sales force and everyone but walking the talk we have to start with the top OK, we have to start with the top. Um, I, I one of the things, you know, uh, John, maybe you can talk about it later, but but you mentioned before audits and monitoring. One of the things I love to implement also um, is controls. OK, uh, I like to implement controls because I think that good or effective controls, well designed controls in PSPs can really help us assure that we are following our ethical guidelines. Um, and, and these controls always need to come after we have a procedure or a guideline in place. Um, but these controls can really help us, and these controls should be implemented effectively in touch points and crossroads when you have you, a potential conflict of interest or when you have a lot of touch points with the patients or the physicians. 
in these places, we must ensure that we have accurate controls. And that means another layers of review, um, uh, proactive monitoring by the compliance professionals, accurate books and records about expenses that are related to PSPs. All of these are accurate and effective controls that must be in place and can really help us design the PSPs according to our ethical values. Um, risk assessment. It was mentioned before by Sergio um, that we always need to remember that we are heavily involved here with the patient. Okay, There is also a very high risk of inducement here because we are talking about financial support in some places. Okay, We need to make sure that we do a right risk assessment in which areas this might not work. Okay, uh, which, which entities we cannot do the, the solutions that we are planning. We need to do a right risk assessment, and this is, I think, one of our forties as compliance professionals, the, the, the ability to be able to look at the situations and to evaluate the risks accurately to help us to make the right decisions, the ethical decisions, to make the decisions, as Sergio mentioned before, to make the right decisions even when no one else is looking, even when there are no guidelines or procedures or, or laws that are in place. Um, I'm a strong believer in tailored solutions. Okay, tailored solutions. We talked about risks. We talked about controls. Each and every compliance professional must look at the different teams and the different goals of the teams, the different operations, and to be able, there isn't one, there isn't one compliance program fits all in these kind of things. We have to tailor our compliance program, our procedures to the needs and the risks of the business. Okay, the needs and the risk of the, of the operational business. Um, so I, I think maybe to summarize my, my answer and, and I, I'll let John you know elaborate, but I think when you when you talk about design, always look at tone at the top. Try to get the endorsement of your top management, understand the risk, implement controls, and tailor a compliance solution that will fit the needs of your business. Okay, don't try to implement something that was for something else or Try to copy a solution that maybe someone else implemented. Look at the situation that you have. Understand the situation. Dig into it. Don't do a high level review. Dig into the details and only with that you'll be able to tailor an effective uh, solution, uh, effective PSP that will be designed according to the ethical values of your company. All right, thank you very much, um, Tal. Um, John, you want to expand on um, what Tal has mentioned? S certainly, and I think the discussion on this topic, I think the discussion on this topic is actually uh, really interesting because it underscores the traditional debate between ethics or the role of ethics and the role of compliance. The terminology obviously isn't fixed, but in broad terms, I generally like to think of compliance as a set of rules or procedures or guidelines. And that's what Tao has been helping lay out for us in terms of how we design a compliance system. Whereas I think Sergio was focusing more on the ethical angle, which I generally like to think of as the values behind an organization or an individual. And it's really th this kind of traditional debate about the importance of the role of both ethics and compliance that I think the PSP question raises. Because right now in many parts of Asia, you don't really have very detailed PSP compliance rules yet. And at the same time, Sergio talked about some of the challenges around um, ethical standards um, in, in the kind of APEC region. And to me, an effective program is one which tries to leverage off the strengths of both ethical considerations, a really strong under, underpinning of ethics within an organization, and also compliance standards to, to kind of strengthen both. But I think therein really lies the challenge because what I find, um, and certainly this has been the case in the last five or 10 years, what I've seen is compliance standards on paper have definitely improved in the last. 10, 15 years, and they continue to improve. And that's partly because there's almost a temptation to just rely on uh, compliance standards because they are tangible, measurable items that you can checklist, um, that you can have a checklist of in 
tick off the boxes. And in, in Asia, APAC, there's been, a, I think, much less of a focus on generally trying to raise ethical standards. But I think as Sergio uh, mentioned, really it's ethics which in some ways underpins your compliance program. If you don't have the ethical underpinning, then when you have a more innovative program like PSPs, which push the limits, and that's where you start hitting the limits of any set of compliance rules or guidelines, because you can't constantly update them and you need to fall back on high ethical standards within the organization. And now there's individuals who accept that this is fundamentally wrong. It doesn't matter whether or not there's a rule in the compliance handbook that says you can't do it. They just accept that ethically, this is a potential red flag. Let me speak with the CEO. That's ideally what you want to achieve. And I think that is the particular challenge in Asia, because in Asia, uh, what I've really seen in a lot of the investigations we've done and a lot of compliance rollout programs we've done, we've seen is there's much more of a focus on improving and getting the compliance rules and policies on paper. But that mindset change that Sergio talked about is the real challenge. And many people, of course, recognize arguably it's a generational thing. You need a new generation or half a new generation who fundamentally are prepared to change the mindset. And that is often the greater challenge. But in many ways, that is the holy grail. If we're able to ensure that ethical standards are raised, then your compliance standards inevitably go along with it. Now, that's not an excuse to say no compliance standards. Of course, you need compliance rules and regulations. But what I suggest is if you tailor that together with the benefits of raising ethical standards, I think that that puts an organization in a much firmer footing uh, for longer term um, improvement in standards. No, thanks, uh, Tal and John. And and follow up lastly, right? Do you see, uh, John, a, a sort of tightening of standards, you know, across Asia with regards to compliance for PSPs? Uh, is that a trend which you see? I, I would say it's patchy in the specific context of PSPs. There's clearly a recognition that's happened for, I guess, a couple of years ago um, as a result of the cases we mentioned earlier, a recognition that this is a risk area, but I think Asia hasn't really begun to grapple with it because PSPs, as we've discussed for, for a while now, are inherently um, more fluid in terms of how they're implemented. They're more difficult to measure and to impose rules on. It's not for example, a simple matter of just imposing a threshold on what level of gifts and entertainment you can provide to someone. It's, it's something that requires a more um, active role of crafting and designing an entirely suitable set of rules. And, and that's the challenge. But the short answer to your question, Nick, is I would definitely say it's patchy. Some clients are, uh, clients are generally obviously aware of it, but, but it isn't high priority right now, uh, in part because of some of the challenges you've talked about. All right. Thanks, John. Right. So I think that concludes our our third segment uh, for today. I think we'll move into the uh, Q&A segment, you know, from the audience. Um, so we have a question, you know, for for John. Um, so a member of the audience asked, you know, what's your advice with regards to managing the knee jerk reaction of over compliance post a major public bridge as you have pointed out that's a great question and, and an extremely challenging one to answer in two or three minutes i mean a couple of high level points i think clearly communication of management is important to make sure that there is broad alignment about what went wrong and that's the question so what went wrong the answer isn't that we were fined 500 million us dollars that is not what went wrong the question is what generally caused it? Where was the failing? Was it one off? Was it with a particular division? Was it something much more fundamental? Was it a complete um, a failure to emphasize ethical standards? Is it a much broader problem that infests the entire organization? Or is it more um, directed at a particular area of the business or, or particular issue? So identify that. Now that sounds incredibly obvious, but I must say that I've been involved in many cases where companies have been fined across a range of industries, life sciences and elsewhere. And it's surprising where sometimes the immediate knee jerk reaction is after something has gone wrong, let's get the professionals in, the compliance professionals in, and they produce a 100 page tome with a with 500 
action points to improve um, the compliance systems. And even after you improve that system, you then test it by saying, well, if what happened previously happens again in a slightly different context, do your compliance rules and changes, do they actually help to preempt and deal with that problem? And you'd be surprised that many issues it doesn't really because it's a long lengthy set of checklists, but it doesn't address the ultimate fundamental failing or problem. Um, controls help, as Charles said, very important, and in some cases it helps, but in many other cases, there is also a fundamental issue that isn't necessarily dealt with by a compliance checklist. So be very clear on the underlying problem, um, what's the real fix behind it? And then, of course, um, with that in mind, being realistic, stepping back and asking yourself, the knee-jerk or automatic reaction shouldn't be, well, I'm just going to raise compliance standards across the board. If, if it ain't fixed, if it ain't broken, you don't need to fix it. But of course, in other cases where there is a fundamental feeling, where that's the genuine cause, then of course, attention should be directed at that. But at a very, very, from a very big picture perspective. So it's not just let's fix precisely what went wrong there, but identify the genuine underlying cause and then make sure that that issue is dealt with across the entire organization. Thank you very much, John. Um, so the second question we have um, from a member of our audience is, you know, programs are usually for a business benefit, which is to increase, you know, revenues package as one for patient benefits. Uh, so how do we reconcile this conflict? You know, um, Sergio, maybe, you know, you can uh, shed some light on this. Sure. Um, this is a great question, actually, and, and, and it's part of, a, of an issue. We compliance officers are constantly, you know, uh, thinking uh, through. As, 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 as we mentioned before, be, below the umbrella of, of patient support programs, we have different kinds of um, of actions that uh, life science companies do, right? Um, and this is a great question in the sense that some of these programs are really to provide access to patients and make sure that their treatments uh, are enhanced. At the same time, we cannot disregard the fact that life science companies are in the market to gain some uh, business benefit, right? But there's different things we do within the scope of our actions, right? The, the patient support programs really, and our clients at the end of the day, our, our, our ultimate goal as, as, as life science companies are patients, right? So these programs are designed in a way to make sure that as we increase the, the, the benefit of our patients in terms of increasing their their uh their treatments the quality of the treatments increases their adherence also sometimes in the in in in, in depends on the drugs but could be the adherence of, of 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 patients to a certain kind of treatment to a certain kind of drug also are aligned right so everything we do as a company we are not ngos right companies are uh, life are not ngos but at the same time we have again the different angles of what we do we have our medical um, uh, let's say functions, we have our marketing functions. So there's when we get into a more, let's say, let's say sensitive discussion on which is the right function doing what, which at the end of the day would be also creating the context on the why we're doing a certain activity. So I think we cannot get a divorce between those kind of things. We usually are doing uh, what our patients or what is best for, uh, for our patients, but also on the side, right? And in parallel, our companies are creating more business because at the end of the day, what we do is selling drugs and marketing drugs. So I think this can require a whole seminar to discuss around this, which would be also a very interesting one. Here's an idea for the next topic for DK, DKSH. But uh, I think this is a great question. Happy to discuss offline on this one. Uh, just giving a very brief uh, high level answer, which is very difficult in a couple of minutes. But I, I think that generally let's keep with get, get the, the message here is that that idea goes hand in hand, but we need to make sure that we keep an eye at all times on how we do stuff. We can create business, but we can create this by doing the right thing. All right, thank you very much, Sergio. I think we've got time, you know, for very quickly for one last question. I think this one, uh, you know, maybe Tal, you know, can can answer. 
so if a company is new to PSPs, where can they find out more about the do's and don'ts to maintain compliance? Thanks, Nick. And um, I think that's the million dollar question. And uh, if, if anyone has a straightforward solution, feel free to forward it to us also. Um, I think you can always start with conducting an open source uh, search and go to resource guides um, of the Department of Justice in the United States, go to industry codes like IFPMA and, and, and other industry codes. And um, as, as said previously in this uh, webinar, um, we always start with the basic elements of an effective compliance program. And, and I think uh, once you understand the what you can or cannot do overall as, as, a, as a pharma company or, or involved in the life science industry, you will be able to carve out of the, the do's and don'ts that are relevant to PSPs. Um, always remember the risks, okay? The risks are a little bit higher here because you touch, you have a, a, a more a, a forward approach when it comes to the patient. You are heavily involved with the patient's treatment, okay? Because you have an influence, influence here, you might suggest an inducement and things like that. So it is important to make sure when you evaluate the risk accurately in the PSPs, you will be able to carve out the do's and don'ts. And I think this might be the addition to Sergio's answer before. Um, uh, when you look at the business benefit of increasing revenue, compliance has a very good uh, and might have a very positive impact here because you can use the fact that you're compliant as a selling proposition. OK, people will want to engage with you as a company that has a solid compliance program and compared to companies that don't have a solid comp compliance program, they don't understand the do's and don'ts when it comes to PSPs. Thank you very much, Tal. So I think with that, uh, it's four o'clock in Singapore. Uh, that brings an end to our webinar today. I would like to thank you know all our panelists for spending time you know sharing their thoughts uh, with the audience and as well as you guys, ladies and gentlemen, you know for tuning in. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, wish you a good evening, and you know stay tuned for the next uh, compliant uh, for the next webinar you know, from uh, DKSH on patient solutions.